So good morning, everyone. Excuse me? OK. Yeah, so good morning, everyone. Um, before I get started, I'd like to congratulate everyone who was involved in the Eclipse Mars release. I think it's a great achievement uh, in terms of timing and quality. So congratulations. But yesterday was not only the release of uh, Eclipse Mars, it was also the release of Buildship 1.0 that we've been working on for the last uh, six to nine months. Um, and as you can see, it's now available in the marketplace. <clears throat> um, before we get started, I'm showing you what's the current state of Buildship 1.0. Um, I'd like to thank a few people that were in, heavily involved in making it happen, um, of pushing out 1.0. So Wayne and Mike from the Eclipse Foundation, Marcus, our mentor from Eclipse Source, Simon from Vogella, and also some guys from Gradleware, or Gradle as it's called now. Um, before we jump into the demo, I would like to give you a few hints on our, on our vision, because behind Buildship there is a vision. Um, so one is um, to make Eclipse more powerful. And what we mean by that is we want the users to be able to do more things from within the IDE. So to give you one example, let's say you want to run your integration tests. Usually that involves setting up a web server, maybe initializing a database, then you want to run the actual tests, and then there needs to be some teardown. Um, all this should be possible from within Eclipse at, with a single click, basically. <clears throat> and it should be the same logic that happens when you run it from the command line or when it happens on your continuous integration server. So we want to we want to get there. If you use Gradle as your build system, these things should be there at a single click from within Eclipse. So you don't have to leave the IDE for these things anymore. Also, there should be a single truth of build logic. Right? Example: you have your Gradle set up, multi-project build. You have project dependencies. You have external dependencies. Um, when you go to Eclipse, you want that same logic of project and external dependencies being applied to your, to your project setup in Eclipse. And um, that's where we want to be, right? And I'm going to show you that. <clears throat> All right, so, so what I'm going to show you is the, the high-level functionality of 1.0. There are many details. I cannot cover them all. But the high-level pieces are the project import, creating new projects, the task view, where you see all the projects and their tasks, executing tasks, and also seeing the progress while you run some builds or while you execute some tasks. <clears throat> all right, with that being said, I'd like to show you what we have. <clears throat> So here we are in Eclipse, um, uh, an empty workspace basically, and we want to import an existing Gradle project. And that's, that's the typical use case, at least in, in, in companies that have hundreds of developers, they don't create their own Gradle projects. Right? They, have existing, they have existing build master teams, create the build, and as a user, you just import it and you work with it. Okay, so, so let's do that. Um, let's import a project. Um, and say build chip, or I can press Gradle, doesn't matter, or enter Gradle, um, and we choose the Gradle import wizard. We give you some hints, you can hide them if you don't want to see them again, and then we get started. And basically the only thing you need to define is your root project directory. So even if you have a single project build, or even a multi-project build, there is a root, and that's all you need to, to specify. And then I can press finish, and it's going to do the import, it's going to do all the magic for us. We have a lot of optional things you can do, like you can add it to, to working sets. Um, you can also define some advanced options, JVM options, program arguments. But we kind of discourage you to do this because as soon as you do this, it's not the single truth of build logic anymore because you're going to do stuff that not every developer is going to do or it's not defined in a build that every developer um, gets the same settings. But if you want to play around, this can be useful. You can also define what Gradle version to use, and those already using Gradle, typically you have the Gradle wrapper in your project, which means everybody gets the same Gradle version and it's defined as part of your project. It's not an external setting, and Gradle will download itself if you don't have it installed yet. 
Um, so the setting, the default setting is also the recommended setting. But I can specify a custom version. We list you all the ones that are available. You can also define some snapshot version if you want to try out a snapshot. Um, okay, now I pressed enter. That was a bit too quick. I didn't want to. So let me delete it again <clears throat> and do the import again. Okay, so we want to specify a custom Gradle version. You can also see it memorizes all the settings that you've entered. Um, so when you launch the import again, it will remember all. It, it will preset all the values that you've defined before. Okay, so I'm using Gradle 2.4, and then I go to uh, the next screen, which gives, uh, gives us a, a preview of what is going to happen. And what you can see is, yeah, what is the root project that we're going to, uh, from where we are going to import. It also tells us the user home directory for Gradle the Gradle version, the Java home directory. And as you can notice, some of these settings we didn't define. But the moment we go to the preview, we ask Gradle, well, what Gradle user home are you going to use? And we can then populate that information. So you have a bit more of an idea what is actually going to happen. You can also see that there's a little exclamation mark um, next to the Gradle version. So what we do is that if you're using a Gradle version that you want to use to build or to run something, um, and it is not the newest one. There might be some limitations that are available or that are not available in, in BuildShip. So let's say you connect to Gradle 1.0. Certain information are just not there in 1.0. So we cannot make use of that information because it's missing in BuildShip. And here we show that to you. So we're connecting to 2.4. It will tell us, well, there's no build and task progress. You will get test progress, but not the other kind of progress. And if you're using an old, even older version, you will get more limitations. Right. So you know what you're expecting. So it's definitely a good, good thing if you want to get the most out of BuildShip to also use a, a latest version of, of Gradle itself. All right. So let's go back. Um, and before I do, let's let's use the Gradle wrapper again. Before I do this, uh, the import, I'm going to add a, a, an error to my build script. And now we're going to go back, I'm going to go to the preview again, and we're going to see some error message. Right? And this happens a lot. We get a lot of mess, uh, re, re, feedback about that is that something is wrong in the build, but you don't really know what. So we spend quite some time on trying to, to give you as much helpful information as, as possible. So what you can see here is that, well, there was some model you couldn't find or couldn't fetch. But then it gives you more details. So it will tell you that this script on this line 26, built a cradle on line 26, has an issue. Um, and what happened? It couldn't find the property called foo. So you don't have to go to the error view of Eclipse to find about that. You can go if you want to, but you can see it right here. So if something goes wrong during the import, we, we try to give you as much information right there. You can also see the old stack trace if you want to, of course. Okay, so let, let me undo that, that, uh, that bug such that we can have a, a clean import. So you can see I'm using 2.5 RC1. That's the latest release or release candidate of Gradle, and it will be the final one in a few weeks. Okay, so now I'm going to start the import. And as I said, the root project directly was all we had to do. We can just press finish. And now it's doing the import. It's doing this all through jobs, so I can cancel it at any point in time. And when I cancel it, it's not just killing the job, it's also telling Gradle to stop doing what it's doing. Right? So if you import a, a very big project um, with hundreds of modules, which is not too rare, um, you can say cancel and Gradle will stop its, its work at, at the earliest point in time possible. So the import finished and we now have in our workspace these projects. I can also import multiple projects, that's not, not an issue. Um, so what happened to these projects is, like I said, we want to have a single truth of build logic. So whatever was defined in the Gradle build itself has also been applied to a project set up in Eclipse now. So um, let's go to the build path and show a little bit more details about that. Um, so there are three source folders that I'm using in this project. By the way, the project that I import, it's called Tooling Commons. It's a small library that we use in BuildShip. Um, to, to communicate with Gradle. It's a little bit of a, just a small layer of abstraction and convenience. There we have three source folders. We have a main Java, we have a test Groovy, and we have a test resources. We have a test Groovy because we use Spock as our testing framework. I rec can recommend it to everyone. 
Um, then we have our libraries. We can see that here. <clears throat> and what we see here is that all the dependencies, our project dependencies and our external dependencies are not just here. We are all putting them in the class path container, which means that every time you open the project, that class path container is refreshed. So if your project changes in between opening it and opening it again, you will get the latest changes. Um, and you can also see, or you can guess, that all the dependencies you see here are not necessarily direct dependencies, but they can also be transitive dependencies. So what we do is we catch the, the transitive closure of all project and external dependencies and put them in the class pass container. By doing this, we don't have to re-export libraries, which is crucial um, with, with several projects because you could have different versions, right? You can have version conflicts between different projects, and by not re-exporting, you avoid that problem. <clears throat> so here we can see tooling model depends on tooling client, but it also depends on tooling utils, but tooling utils is not a direct dependency, it's a, it's a transitive dependency. The same is true for the external dependencies. Not all of them are directly dependencies of this tooling model, but they come through a transitive dependency. All right. <clears throat> So that's how we set up the class path container, which also makes it possible to share the project settings if you want to. And just because the build changes and, and one of the versions is adjusted or a new dependency is added, it will not change your project settings file because all it has is a reference to the class path container. And that's the concept of JDT. That's not our invention. We just leverage it. Right. So, so that, that's basically it. So here we see the summary. We see the sources and all the project and external dependencies we put in a class pass container. All right. If you do make modifications, we, we remember that. So if let's say you add a library manually, which we don't suggest, but if you did, um, we would keep it the next time we reopen the project. All right, so we see the projects in the workspace. We saw that the same project and external dependencies that were defined in the Gradle build are also applied to your Eclipse workspace. And now we want to do something with this, right? So the first thing is the task view. So here in the task view, we can see all the projects that were imported, even if it's from multiple root projects, um, and we can see their tasks. That's down here. Um, so depending on what, what plugins we apply, what custom tasks we define, we see more or less tasks here. Um, we have some filtering possibilities. So right now we only so show the task selectors, which means it's the aggregation of the recursive tasks of this project and the sub-projects. We can also show the direct project tasks. We can also show private tasks. Um, yeah, that, that's up to you. We can also order differently. So we have a few means to, to visualize or change the visualiza visualization. Um, we can also filter. So I can say I'm only interested in the build tasks and I will see the build tasks. That's the common filtering mechanism of, of Eclipse we use. <clears throat> right. Another thing we can do is here in the task view, we can open the build script. So if I'm on a project, I can say open build script and I will see the, the build script here. Right now, there is no syntax highlighting or, or co-completion, but that will come in the next release because the focus on 1.0 was on the user and not on the build master. All right. So let's execute some tasks. So I'm going to go to, maybe make this a bit bigger, it's a small resolution. I'm going to run clean build. Usually I don't run clean, but I have to do it here because if I don't, Gradle doesn't do much because it knows nothing has changed and then it will do the minimum. Right, so, but I want to force it to do more than it needs to. Um, so I, I can also select multiple tasks and then I can run them. And it will run them in the order that I click them. So I'm running clean build and then I can see that the same output you would see on the console, you also get here in the, in, in the console view of Eclipse. You can also see what, what, what's actually started, with what, what are the settings for it and the actual output. And um, I, I, on purpose, added a test failure. We'll come back to that in a second. So we also have a little bit of color highlighting, like you know it from the command line. OK. What happens when you run a task is it creates a, a new run configuration if it doesn't exist already. Um, so I can also say open run configuration. And the screen you see here is, should look familiar. It's this 
the similar one that you would see for, for other run configurations like running JUnit tests, running Java applications or whatnot. Um, you can define the, the, the Gradle tasks that we were, so I can even add more stuff here if I wanted to. Um, we can also change the Gradle distribution. So by default, it's using what was used during the import, but I can say, well, during the import, I used the wrapper, but now I want to see how does it work with the latest 2.6 snapshot. Is it still working? Is it faster? Whatever. Um, so I can, on a per run configuration base, I can change the settings, or maybe I want to use different arguments to experiment. Okay, it's all possible. You can also use variables like you see down here with the workspace location. That's the all standard Eclipse stuff. Okay, you can also see it here from the wrong configurations. Uh, it's a bit of a big screen. Like you have Java applications, you have Gradle project, and you can create new one. Um, it's up to you what you want to add here. Okay, so this basically covers the, the task execution. <clears throat> but we can do better. Um, you see here the output, it's kind of text-based, and we could do some screen scraping and make it look a bit richer, but that's not needed because Gradle has a very rich domain model, and so it knows about all the subtleties of your build. It knows the difference between something failing and passing and between a task and a test task and a copy task, etc. And since it has all this information, it's really just rich objects. Um, we can reuse that also for visualization, and that's what we do. So I'm going to run this again, I'm going to say clean build, <clears throat> and now we stay on this Gradle executions view. And here you can see basically the whole life cycle of running this build. Um, I'm going to adjust uh, the headers a bit. All right. Okay, so what you see here, as I said, is basically the life cycle of a Gradle build. You can see that in the beginning, it's running some init scripts, then it's loading the projects, it's configuring the build, it's calculating the task graph. So all these task dependencies, in the end, are put in, into a sequence such that it knows how to run them. All that's done, and once that's ready, it will run the actual tasks. And then you can see what has all been run. So I said clean and I said build, and because build has dependencies on other tasks, I can also see them being run. Right. Um, and um, so here we see that some tasks were up to date. So nothing had to be compiled, um, no production code for Groovy, so it just says up to date, like you know it from the command line as well. And then it gets to the test task. And the test task, as I said, there is a rich domain model behind it, so it knows more details about it. It knows the exact tests that it was running, and test class it was running, and the actual test methods that it was running. Um, you can see that here. And then here's our test that was failing, so we can mark that or visualize that in a different way. You can say, oh, this, this test has been failing. There's also one that is gray because I ignored it. Right, so we, you can see at one glance, oh, things have been ignored, things have been failing. And this, this failure percolates up to the whole build. So because one test failed, basically the whole build is considered to have failed. Okay, so let's find out, find out a few more details about this failure. Um, this is a Spock test, so you get much richer um, feedback about the failure than you're used to at uh, JUnit, and that by itself is a reason to use Spock. <coughs> So here we can see, okay, value should not be null, but it is null, right? And then we can also see some more details below. Okay. Um, the other thing I can do is, if I'm up here, let's say, what went wrong with the build? Maybe I don't even want to go down to the test. I just want to see what went wrong. And I can see here as well, oh, okay, um, the, the test task has, has failed, tooling test, right? I can even go and see the test summary. So th this is something that Gradle always generates is a test summary, and I can see it right here from within Eclipse. So I don't have to go to the command line and copy that URL that you see on the command line and jump there, or open it in a browser, but you can see it right from within um, Eclipse, and you see the same thing basically here again. Right. Okay. The other thing we show you here is um, the duration. So you can see the whole, the whole build takes, took eight seconds. Um, and you can see of these eight seconds, 7.7 .7 seconds were, were spent in running the tasks. And that, that can vary, right? Sometimes it can be that 
that uh, loading the project takes longer, and you can see that here reflected. You might al also have noticed that we update the running time, so while it's still running, you will see, okay, running for three seconds, four seconds, etc., cetera, um, until it's actually done. Okay. You can also rerun the build. I can just click here, and it will rerun it. I can also stop it, so if I rerun it, and I stop it here, it will stop the build, meaning it will tell Gradle, stop what you're doing, abort. We can also jump to the console. Maybe there's a reason once in a while you want to jump to the console. So for each Gradle build we run, we have this execution view, but we still have the console view as well. And we can jump right there from, from here. We can also navigate between the different execution views. So they all remain open until you close them all at once or individually. And again, you can filter here. <clears throat> so, so that is the current state of the execution view. So see, you see the durations, you see the different lifecycle states, and we can make that even more fine-grade. So while loading a project, we can show you what, what is happening in terms of dependency resolution in accessing remote repositories, and so on and so on. So this is now going to be extended over time. So this basically um, concludes the current functionality of BuildShip 1.0. Uh, the one thing I didn't show is the creation of a new project, but it's very simple. You just say um, you want to create a new project, give it a name, you can see a preview, and it's happening. It's a, it's a similar wizard to what you see for the import. Right. So to summarize, you can import a project, you can create a new project, you can see the tasks, you can run tasks, and you can see a visualization of the build actually being executed and its progress. And there is some support for dealing with failures, seeing the failures, investigating the failures. All right. <clears throat> so we're not done yet. We'll, we'll never be. Um, What's coming up next is we want to give you more fine-grade operation progress. That's what I just mentioned, right? like dependency resolution, loading of plugins, etc. It just gives you more insight into the build while it's running. Um, in general, we want to give you more build insights. So we also want to give you a plugins view, so you can see for each project what plugins have been applied, where do these plugins come from, or a dependencies view, not the same one that you see in the in the build path, which is a transitive closure, but really see this project has this direct project and external dependencies. Test execution, if this is almost done. This will be available in 2.6 of Gradle, and then we will integrate it into BuildShip, which means, let's say we have this failing test, maybe one or more, and we can say rerun these failing tests. And these tests will then again be run through Gradle. And the thing to keep in mind is, let's say you have integration tests, and you define them in your Gradle build, usually what happens is you have another task that will first set up uh, like a web server or, or initialize your database, and you have some finalizer tasks that run afterwards that then shut down everything and clean up everything. So if you're then going to run that single test, since it's run, run through Gradle, it will run the same task before and after as well. So the cleanup and the setup is taken care of even if you run single tests. Or you can right-click on a test in your IDE and say run it, and it will do the same thing, running it through Gradle. Test debugging, so like executing a test, you want to run it in debug mode, and you still want to use all the debug facility that you have in Eclipse, um, but you want the actual test be executed through Gradle. So that, that's coming right after the test <coughs> execution. So you can leverage all the debug faci facilities that you have in Eclipse, but have Gradle execute the actual test in debug mode. Project conversions, you can take a project, a Java project, say convert to a Gradle project, and it will try its best to convert it to a Gradle project. Task glossary, that goes towards build masters, that's also, it's already basically ready, we just need to integrate it, is that you can create, insert new tasks in your build scripts, and you don't have to remember what is the name or the type of the task, what are the properties. And there's more, but the, the first uh, five items are still around the build user, except maybe the project conversion, and um, they are ta tackled next. Um, if you want to know more about where are these things located around BuildShip, so we are on GitHub, is where our code is. Um, you can also submit pull requests there if you want to, or you can look at the current state, the history, etc. It's all on GitHub. 
Um, the project itself is, is hosted on projecteclipse.org, so we are a, an official Eclipse project. And we are also in the marketplace, that the new marketplace that the Eclipse Foundation created for Eclipse Mars. <clears throat> but it's even easier to just go to Eclipse. Within Eclipse Mars, you go to the marketplace and you search for BuildTip and it's right there. All right, so what I suggest is that you, you give it a try. Um, as I said, you can get it right from within Eclipse Mars, or you can get it from an update site on eclipse.org. We also support all versions from 3.6 on to 4.5, and we have individual update sites for each of these versions. Um, and BuildShip 2.0 is planned to then be part of um, the Eclipse release train and to be part of one of the packages. So in, I think, September or October. All right. So thank you very much, and I hope you have fun with Pilchip. If there are any questions, we might have a few more minutes. Yes? Yes, I mean, we've had this um, feedback before. Um, I would say yes, it's planned, but we haven't tackled it yet, yes. What we already do is, um, and we have like projects like Xtex that already make use of that, is that if you have a project that is not a Java project or it's configured in a very special way, if you already have a dot settings folder in, your pro in one of these projects that you import, we ignore it. We just add the Gradle nature, such that you see the Gradle tasks, but we will otherwise not touch it. So let's say you have a big project and one of them you don't want us to touch or create the class pass container, etc. If you have a settings folder in there, we will, we will not touch it except adding the Gradle nature. So that's what some people do, and it could also be like an intermediate step to having an OSGI project. Yeah? Right now it's only working for Java, and it's working for Groovy, if you have uh, the Groovy plugin installed. And the uh, guys from Pivotal, they have updated their, I think it's called Greclips or something like that, they have updated it for Eclipse Mars just like two weeks ago or so. So if you have Java or Groovy, and for Groovy, you have the Groovy plugin installed, then it works for these two um, languages. Adding support for other languages is definitely possible. Um, so let's say we wanted to support Scala. We could do that, but it would then mean you have to have the Scala plugin installed um, in order to, for it to work. Yeah, yes, so the question is, is there a special repository or something to deal with dependencies when you use Gradle? So that's a general Gradle question. Um, Gradle it doesn't have its own dependency server or something. It's 100% Maven compatible. So it just connects to Maven or, or um, Maven Central or, or, or um, JSender or your internal Nexus um, or, um, repository. Uh, yeah, 100% compatible. It doesn't have anything on its own right now. Yes. It, it's it's compliant with Maven. Yes, 100%. Yes. Yeah. No, you know, you don't need to. No, no. You can even connect, you can even get your dependencies from a local Maven repository. Yeah, that was the question. I mean, if I only want to use Gradle, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't have the, the local Maven. Yes, if you're only using Gradle, you don't need to have Maven installed, you don't need to have a Maven repository. It has its own repository. So 
Yes, once the depend well, the dependencies have to get to Gradle once, but once it has downloaded the dependencies from a remote server, it caches them locally and will access them locally. Right. Yeah, and that's basically what happened when I ran the build so, several times. It always checks dependencies whether it has these exact versions from that repository. And if, it, if that is cached locally, it will use that version. But I can say that the dependency management is way ad more advanced than the one you used to from, from Maven. It, it, it deals with many intricacies in, in a much better way. Um, so it's definitely a, a super dependency management system by itself. All right. So thank you for your time and have a great conference. <laughs>